What's up, everyone? It is 3 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon, which means you're tuning in to Cannabis Legalization News. Today, we are joined by entrepreneur and veteran cannabis activist Steve D'Angelo. So let's bring on the team. Happy Sunday, everyone. Thanks for joining us, Steve. Thanks for having me. Great to be here with you. Super excited. Yeah, totally. I mean, like, um, I've heard you referred to as the father of the legal cannabis industry. How did you come by that moniker? Well, that's the name that Willie Brown gave me. Uh, he's the former mayor of San Francisco, former uh, speaker of the assembly of the California assembly, one of the most, still to this day, even in his 80s, one of the most politically powerful people in the state. And he said that because I, I got one of the very first six cannabis licenses issued anywhere in the United States that was in the city of Oakland, and then went on to create some other iconic, uh, that was the Harborside um, dispensaries, which you know kind of grew to be famous because of our struggles with the federal government. Yeah. Um, but then I went on to, to create a couple of other businesses. One was the Artview Group, which was the first cannabis investment in, uh, uh, company. So if you were looking for someone to thank or blame for bringing the investors into cannabis, <laughs> uh, you've got them at your- You, you can't, but like, I don't <laughs> want to fault you on the investors in cannabis because uh, this is a regulated plant. This plant is going to be as regulated as casinos and hospitals to a certain extent because, like, uh, we had we had Ed Rosenthal on last week, and we've had uh, other operators on from the Bay Area, and they say the price of flour, especially after the uh, the wildfires that have gone through, it's it's hey it's it's pretty high up there. And so, like, you know, if you're talking about something in Illinois here, it's like four thousand dollars wholesale, you know, uh, up to eight thousand dollars retail that's as good as cash. And that's the same reason like when you have a, a casino, you have a vault because that's where the money is and you have to be careful with it. So like, you know, the regulations are going to be vast. And I think that's really why the, one of the reasons why you need those investors in. So I don't, I don't, I don't fault the investors coming into the industry at all. Yeah. And you know, the, the that's one of the, the, the misnomers, I think, too. Like when medical started back in Prop 215 in the beginning, I, I imagine you, you've you heard us a lot, Steve, when they were like, how can you make profit? How is it medicinal? How how are you? You know, they wanted this altruistic, like, I'm going to give you weed and, and not pay my bills. It, it's ridiculous. You know, the, well, let me let me uh, agree with you in terms of the investors. I think that um, you know what we know about the world today is that the political class works at the behest of and is the servants of the investor class. And so, if we really want to see significant system system wide change, global change, then we have to engage engage that that investor class. Let me push back on the idea of, of vast regulations on cannabis. Um, cannabis has been used successfully by human beings uh, basically for as long as we've been human beings. You can go back and find, you know, well over 10,000 years ago, human beings using cannabis. Uh, during that period of time, it's been used successfully by almost every culture uh, and almost every religion on the planet at one time or another. Um, without any problems. It's it's only in the last hundred years that you see this kind of bizarre aberration in human history where the most valuable plant on the planet has somehow uh, been recast as dangerous. And, and not coincidentally and contemporaneously with that demonization of cannabis, you saw the rise of pharma, you saw the rise of big chemical agriculture, you saw the rise of armament companies, you saw the rise of a lot of other things that aren't very healthy in our world. And so Plastics, I don't see any need for the regulation. The, the regulation may serve the interest of the government and it may serve the interest of the investor class. It certainly does not serve the interest of cannabis consumers. If you talk to cannabis consumers, and ask them what their main problem is with cannabis, assuming that they're living someplace where it's legal, they'll say it's too expensive, it costs too much, I can't buy enough legally, I'm forced down to the underground market even because it's legal because of the high taxes and the ridiculous regulations. Yeah. Do you s believe the regulations are uh, the current incantation of this, the prejudice against this plant that goes back for decades? Yeah, I mean, look, um, uh, if by any objective standard, uh, you would consider radioactive waste to be more dangerous than cannabis. Um, <laughs> yet in the state of California, the transport, the tracking and the regulation of cannabis on a, on a gram for gram basis is more strict and more demanding than the standards for the transportation and the tracking of radioactive waste. 
um, by any objective standard, we would have a tax policy that encouraged people to use a safe and natural plant that nobody's ever overdosed from. It tends to make people more contemplative, gentle, and thoughtful mm. rather than incentivizing people to buy alcohol. Um, if you take a look at the cannabis taxes in California, their magnitudes greater than the taxes on alcohol. Alcohol kills thousands and thousands of people in this state and millions of people around the world. So if we're really going to rationally have a policy that incentivizes people to use a safe substance and, and, and discourage them from using something dangerous, then we would totally change, change this on the head. Cannabis would be tax free and alcohol would be taxed at a rate several magnitudes higher than it is today. Steve, I totally agree with you. Uh, Tom, unfortunately, the lawyer to him has to have this regulated system. I personally believe uh, uh, lab regulation is plant regulation. Like if we just made it so recreational markets were to like mandate the testing process. And honestly, I think that's what kicked our ass here in Washington for the medical scene. Uh, you started Steep Hill, which is one of the first testing labs like, yay. And uh, uh, I did a video recently uh, that we'll put out later, but NIST is actually uh, doing studies with THC and CBD, uh, like, so we have no shit references. Um, man, I just wanted to say, this is great talking to you. <laughs> well, it's great talking to you. My favorite thing to do in the whole world. Well, I mean, like, with the actual regulation aspect of it, how do you give assurances and assuage the notion? I mean, it's like Illinois is a very liberal state. So we were able to be the first state that legislatively made this uh, a, a proposition where you can have a, a regulated market in cannabis. There is a stigma against this plant that people are like, oh, well, we'll believe in the medical, but we won't believe in the recreational. And then it has to be extremely, I mean, like it's, it's more regulated than heroin. And so it has to be like that stringent thing. And then we'll go, okay, we'll acquiesce. So like, you know, I, I think the regulations are used to help open the door to it so you can actually get there. And then hopefully you can get more of a, an Oklahoma model where, you know, it's what I don't like about the industry sometimes is that it seems a little bit more like a cartel and a little bit less like America entrepreneurialism where you're able to access the market. Yeah, look, um, uh, I think that the role that you describe for medical cannabis is a role that it's played very effectively across the country. Uh, you are going into a situation where people are adamantly opposed to cannabis of any type. And the only legal change that you can feasibly get is, is around medical cannabis. But if you pass a reasonably effective medical cannabis law that allows doctors without a great deal of fear or hassle to prescribe cannabis or recommend cannabis for a wide range of conditions, what happens is very soon, within five years or so, a huge number of people in that state start using cannabis who never, ever would have gotten anywhere close to it before because their doctors recommend it to them. And they have a great experience with them. It's usually transformative in their lives. Sometimes it saves their lives. And so naturally, they recommend this very useful and safe medicine to all of their friends and to all of their families. And over the course of 5 or 10 or 15 years, what happens is the stigma that has been planted in people's brains and hearts, really, by decades of government-funded propaganda and lies and pseudoscience is, is directly contradicted by their personal experience. And, and almost always, once people have had personal direct experience of cannabis, their reaction is, oh my God, I've been lied to all of this time. Yes. So absolutely, it plays that role. Mm. But what we have to be careful of is, is then the, the temptation and what, what happens is you get an industry that gets locked into that model of, of high regulation. That industry then goes out. And it's it's a high regulation, but the high regulation enables the monopolization because that high regulation puts that barrier up. OK, how do we get in? You can't. There's only four licenses. Well, oh, look at Florida, right? I mean, right. Florida in the United States of America, which is supposed to be dedicated to free enterprise, right? To equal opportunity. You have a situation where just a few companies have been given unlimited licenses across the supply chain, right? Which means two things. One, they have vast market power. And, and two, unless they already have tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars of capital to build that vast infrastructure, right? They have to go out and they have to raise it, right? And either way, what happens is people who are already wealthy, 
who have already built fortunes in other industries at a time when there's been a massive redistribution of wealth in this country towards that segment of the population from us, okay, um, we're creating a, we're giving away, right? It's a giveaway of this, you know, huge opportunity for American entrepreneurs to six or seven or eight companies that, that aren't good at cannabis. They don't know anything about cannabis. No, they they have to bribing politicians you know? right. and bribing politicians. investors. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and then that, that was something that we got a, a, a huge taste of. And like a, a lot of the cannabis industry is just getting soap in the mouth of the entrepreneurs when that first round, when it, the state just first opens and it comes out and it's like, wait, how come all the winners are for some reason extremely wealthy and political? And it's like, uh, well... Because this ain't Oklahoma, you know, you know, this ain't Michigan. Uh, it, it's I, I support the concept of like an open license type where you can get in the industry. Sure. Not everybody can. And then there are there are rules like testing, purity. And then, of course, seed to sale tracking so that the taxes, which that's even if this was regulated like alcohol and had that level of social acceptance, the most expensive ingredient that I'm aware of in alcohol is the taxes. And I think that's going to be the same thing for cannabis. Um, well, again, I don't think that it needs to be that way. And I don't think right. that it should be that way, right? If we're taking a look at it from an objective uh, uh, lens of what benefits society the most rather than what politicians are comfortable with, then we know that an extremely low tax or a no tax um, uh, system for cannabis is, I mean, why tax cannabis at all? Why should it be taxed? It's it's it. it we have here's a plant which removes twenty tons of atmospheric carbon for every hectare that's harvested. Okay, mm. here's a plant which you can create um, uh, ethanol out of. Here's a plant which is na natural and safe medicine for almost every illness that we know of. Okay. Um, why would we want to discourage people from using this plant? If we had a rational system, we'd be paying subsidies to our That's farmers not to, not to put in dairy farms, but to grow more cannabis. That's right? right. You were just you you set up that storyline very well. I don't think it was your first time that you've told it because like you're like you were setting it up for like there's a public benefit that's happening. Why are we going to sit there and say it's a, it's a sin? Why are we going to have an excise on this? How come this is not getting subsidized, but big beef and big dairy is getting mm. subsidized and big grain and big fructose is getting subsidized? Those guys had an industry association. It was not a federal crime to have milk. And if it was, I'm sure that like the illicit cheese market would have been alive and well in, in Wisconsin. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's a it's a very valid point that uh, we can set agendas in our policy based on whether we want to tax it or whether we want to subsidize it. And uh, I can see a lot of uh, uh, arguments for subsidizing cannabis. But the problem is then people will think that you're just a crazy hippie. Well, you know, I think well, so that's what they've thought my whole career. OK, <laughs> 50 years ago, I was talking about this stuff and people were like, ah, he's just a young, crazy hippie with these unattainable dreams. Right yeah. now it's legal. It's legal in Illinois, man. It's legal in Chicago. It's legal in California. Okay. So how much of a crazy hippie I am. And then you look at the other thing us crazy hippies have brought up. Oh, let's see this little thing like yoga and acupuncture that we introduced to the mainstream or organic food that we introduced to the mainstream, or as we were talking a little bit earlier, the personal computer. Okay. None of those things would exist without people who used cannabis and other visionary plants and substances. Oh, totally. You know, but I think to the, the regulations credit, because like with the investor thing, investors like to have security. Investors don't, no one got involved when everything was medical. When Prop 215, when it was just medical, there was no money involved because they were afraid. And no, there was no money involved because it was nonprofit by law. Yeah. Believe me, if it had been profit making, they would have been beating their, 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 the door down to come to us. Look, it's not necessary to have this ridiculous top down system. One of the issues you've got in Illinois is, is that it was done by the legislature and the legislature is bought by certain people. And it's not unique to Illinois. It's unique to every single state in the country. And, and a polite way of saying that is that there's certain interest groups that have influence with politicians. And, and, and that's true uh, everywhere, right? But you can also, be, the, because the, the legislation in Illinois came from the top down, it really catered to those interests. The difference between Oklahoma and Illinois is that Oklahoma was an initiative. It came not from the top down, 
right? It came from the bottom up. And so the grassroots was able to mold what it was going to be and what it was going to look like so that it would serve our interest rather than the interest of the existing power structure. And this is the kind of cannabis industry we should demand everywhere in the world. Why shouldn't cannabis farmers be able to grow their weed and take it to a cannabis retailer? And if the retailer wants to buy it from them, buy it from them. What's wrong with that? You know, uh, I'd like to point out though, Oklahoma is still just a medical market. Uh, you know, they had what Washington had. It was awesome. You know, we had farmers markets here at one time. Yeah. Like, uh, and then just to speak to the, the user experience and the customer experience of buying uh, cannabis in Oklahoma or in Illinois, like you're not allowed to see it. You're not allowed to have bulk flour, so you can't make your own pre-rolls. You get uh, something that you can't touch. You have to order off an iPad. They put into a, pra a paper bag. It's already shrink wrapped, already weighed. Not sure how fresh it is. You have to leave the facility and then you can inspect the weed that you've already purchased, which you can't return. It's a horrible model. It's a dictatorial top-down model. It's not something that, that a group of people, a community of people who cared about cannabis, that's the last kind of model we would make. What we're seeing is a grudging, bare acceptance of cannabis legalization and a backdoor attempt to use regulations to maintain the stigma and the stigmatized position of cannabis in our society. And, you know, we need to engage these folks in open debate. Um, uh, you know, for a long time, we've talked about the tax benefits and the harms of prohibition. It, it's now time to have the clear and open debate. Is cannabis good for society or is it bad for society? If it's good for society, we should embrace it, embrace it. We should subsidize it. We should teach our children to use it. We should welcome it. And if it's bad for society, then it should be banned. Okay. Let's have that conversation because I know that any fact, evidence, and science-based conversation on the benefits of cannabis versus the harms of cannabis is going to result in a model that has no or very, very minimal regulation. Well, has there been a report that made cannabis bad? I don't think the LaGuardia or any other ones had any negative. Uh, no. And then the, the, the supreme irony of the cannabis uh, plant is that it's only really you're, if you're going to try to research it in the United States for the past 50 to 80 years, the only research that you would have been granted any permission to do was to find the harm. And so like the research published by Dr. Tashkin over decades where like he's looking and he's still looking for that harm. And the only thing he finds or for some reason it seems to protect you against various things. And then you find out there's actually a patent uh, that the United States government was just kind of like saying like, hey, everybody. It actually is a neuroprotector and an antioxidant, and we're just disclosing that. But yet Congress does nothing. Yeah, well, look, uh, Congress, is, uh, Congress is corrupt. Um, Congress right now is only representing the interest of a very narrow um, – Congress as a whole, right, as a whole, the Senate and the House – are only representing the interest of a very narrow band of Americans. And that narrow band of Americans, even in the Democratic Party, for the most part, uh, doesn't care about cannabis legalization. This is why we just saw the establishment candidate, Joe Biden, on the Democratic side, walking back the, re the, the progress we'd made in the Democratic Party. The last Democratic platform actually called for legalization. This one calls for decriminalization, which at the federal level means zero. It means absolutely nothing, right? Um, we just saw the Moore Act, um, who, you know, the, the Moore Act was voluntarily pulled by who? Well, by Kamala Harris, the lead sponsor of the Moore Act, right? Um, uh, so I don't get that. I thought that was like terrible calculus on their part, because if this is a referendum year, us versus them, what a wonderful way to just draw a distinction. Be like, well, you know, as a single issue cannabis voter, because, you know, it's what I do for a living. Uh, I would prefer to not be a criminal in my day to day life. Kind of yeah, like but, that, right. you know, but both uh, Biden and Harris are beholden to some powers that have funded and backed their candidacies over the years. In the case of Kamala Harris, 
even though she tries to paint herself as a progressive prosecutor, her main allies in her political career have been law enforcement organizations. And uh, there's a whole long story about how she betrayed us in California we don't need to go into. Um, uh, but uh, on the side of Biden, he, he also you know, has this very long record of supporting legislation that basically resulted in mass incarceration. He was the vice president. He was in the White House when, when we passed Prop 215 in California, and that White House sent out not just their drug czar, but three other former drug czars to California to hold a press conference to say what? To say what? You might remember this one. Cannabis, medical cannabis, it's just Cheech and Chong mm. medicine. Really? That's so you right. want to tell that to all the millions of people who have had their lives saved now, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, that's one of the... The biggest thing is like, uh, it's it's so hard when you talk about legalization because you get frustrated, emotionally, uh, exhausted, um, because it's 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 about much more than just medicine too. It's it's a social equity issue, social justice, um, you know, a racial issue. There there's so much before a single issue. It has like five benefits. <laughs> like I would like to like live in a world that's not bullshit. You know, wouldn't it be nice if we lived in a world where like you go, well, why are the laws that way? Sit down, racism. You know, like you know, that from 80 years ago, you're like, wait a minute. You're yeah. telling me that we haven't fixed shit from 80 years ago? Well, you know, sometimes the roads fall apart. Wait, why? Well, because our rich people only pay $750 a year in taxes. What the fuck? Who the hell's running this? You know, uh, it's it just it's you, frustrating. Well, the, the reason, the, you know, the reason the explanation there <clears throat> is that rate <clears throat> cannabis prohibition was originally conceived of as a measure of racial control because cannabis came to this country in the hands of black and brown people and the authorities wanted a way to just be able to pick somebody off the street and search them and oppress them and ask them a bunch of questions and lock them up right that's and it. So that's why it was originally passed but the reason it's been maintained is because that same desire for social social control that same desire to maintain white supremacy has been served by the continuing prohibition of cannabis, right? Um, and, and, you know, the organization I founded a year ago, The Last Prisoner Project, just released a report called The Carceral State, and as an incarcerate, as in a state that incarcerates a lot of people because we incarcerate a higher proportion of our population in the United States of America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, than any other country in the world, yes, including North Korea, yes, including the People's Republic of China, yes, including Russia, um, and uh, and 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 so the, the the that system has has been maintained. You can take a look. You read this carceral report, and it talks exactly how about in the 1980s and the 1990s, <clears throat> huge amounts of federal grants were given to local police departments. And they were conditioned on the fact that they showed a increase, a certain increase in the arrest for cannabis uh, uh, crimes. And there's this huge, huge climb that that happens that was absolutely intentional, and 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 people in, intended, right? And uh, and so, I guess um, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty <laughs> overwrought about the elections. My message to cannabis voters is. Yeah. I understand why you're voting for Biden. Okay. Yeah. I get it. Right. It's like, I can't go out and pull the lever for a fascist either. Okay. No matter, no matter how much history I've got with their opponent. Right. right. But, we, but what we need to do is this before we pull the lever, before we fill in the ballot <clears throat> for anybody, get in touch with them, get in touch with their campaign, put three, four, five, six good solid hours into making it clear to them that next election, we probably are not going to be put in the same moral quandary we're in this election. We will be more free to vote our consciences. And should the Biden administration fail to modernize its approach on cannabis and make it consistent with basic justice and equity, we will vote for somebody else next time. Absolutely. And do that for your elected representatives in Congress as well, because that really has the the ability to see if the safe banking act gets through or if the more act actually gets a vote and then maybe can get to the senate if, if there's not that many seats that need to move in the senate so maybe then it might not hit this buzzsaw uh, called mike crapo and then the judicial well i'm not sure it was the judiciary committee in the senate that just gutted the safe banking act and said it's okay i'll support it if marijuana is two percent thc 
And you're like, wow, where's this guy coming from? Idaho. Oh, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I I guess my point is um, I think that that, you know, supporting Biden Harris is important so that we have a democratic system to engage with at at the end of the next election. Mm. Uh, At the same time, I don't fool myself about the nature of that administration. I can tell you that that if Kamala Harris was vice president and she had the deciding vote in the Senate on a cannabis reform bill and Joe Biden told her to vote no on it, she would vote no on it and she wouldn't think twice about it. And she would give an interview the next day doing just what she did to us in California, laughing about it. Oh, gosh. I hate that people just look at the cannabis issue and they trivialize it and they give it no due cause until it's too late. And then it helps somebody in their family. And then suddenly they've had a change of heart about it. I, and I don't like the, what that says about us as a, as a civilization or as people that we will wait until it's too late and then it's it's us. Yeah. You know, we have no ability to see like this is hurting someone else. This is hurting someone else's family, especially when they make it into the black and brown people, because the, the 13th Amendment and slavery, unless you're a criminal. And then, you know, the Marijuana Tax Stamp Act did a real good job of making it easy to arrest the people that used to be slaves and making them criminals so they could be slaves again. But, Tom, this is America. Our laws are always right and they're always on point. And they always have the the, the, the justice thing in mind. No, they, I do that with lawyers. I do that with lawyers. I'm like, because they, 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 one of the reasons when I was in law school, they'd be like, well, why are you smoking weed? I'm like, because it's freaking awesome. Have you tried smoking weed? And then uh, they're like, no, no, it's illegal. I can't do that. You're supposed to uphold the law. So if this was 1847, you would be a slave state holder. And they hated that. They hated that I would insinuate that maybe they would have been following that law. Well, even like what Steve said, you know, there has to be a conversation. But in the end of that conversation, there's going to be one sentence. And the most dangerous thing about cannabis is the law. Getting caught with it. Yeah. Yeah, That's it. There's nothing, you know, an overdose involves a large pizza and Pink Floyd. Well, it's it's look, it, it has cannabis prohibition has caused incalculable damage. OK, you could argue you could argue that it is the, if not one of the major causes of climate change. Okay, oh, There was a debate that was going on in the United States from the uh, turn of the century until around 1937. And that debate was about how our industrial economy should be developed. And there were two groups, the Comergists and the Internationalists. The Comergists said quite reasonably, we should get the raw materials for American factories from American farms. We can make everything that we need that way. Henry Ford made a plastic car out of hemp and other farm crops that was 10 times stronger than steel. On the other side, you had the internationalists. And they said, wait, we just came out of World War II. We've got this big military. Why should we go through all the trouble of like growing crops? We, we have armies. We can go take over other people's lands. We can get the, all that oil underneath Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, uh, and then we can bring the oil and all that stuff back to the United States for raw materials for our factories. And, and, and then we, you know, we'll be the dominant world power. And that's what we should do. Well, we know who won that debate. But now consider, okay, that should the Comergists have won that debate, should we have been planting hemp for food, for fuel, for fiber, for our clothing, for plastics, instead of pumping petroleum out of the earth and burning it up and heating up the, the atmosphere, Way we could world. be living on a Way clean planet. And they also waged the war over the petroleum. You remember 20 years ago when they're like, well, let's go and uh, fuck up that Saddam guy. And then they just, just and then I was driving back today, uh, it's $2.24 for a gallon of gas here in Peoria, Illinois. Well, and if, you know, right? It didn't have to be this way. Yeah, and I also believe the uh, the original DC uh, diesel engine was made for hemp oil, and uh, it was petroleum yeah, that took over. The diesel diesel oils, right. Diesel, right. Diesel's original engine, what, he was a comergist, and he believed in this philosophy. It's absolutely the philosophy that we should go back to today because now we have technological tools with things like smart breeding uh, that we didn't have uh, years and years and years ago. And so, you know, we really have the ability now, both from a medical therapeutic point of view and from an industrial point of view, to unlock the full potential of the plant. And there's no doubt in my mind this will happen. 
-hmm. because we're at a point, there's so many people in the world that we can't afford anymore to ignore a really valuable resource like this. So it is going to happen. Um, maybe not in my lifetime. Okay. But Tom, in your lifetime, I predict you're going to have to hold me to this after I'm gone. Uh, that cannabis by dollar volume, right? By dollar volume, cannabis you know is going to be the most valuable crop, most valuable product on the planet. Everything. Oh, especially, especially when you look at like the carbon nanotube type of stuff that they talk about for like in the future, like, wait, you mean this atom can actually reform and like with all the other ones? Do we have any sources where we could just pull this out of the ground? Oh, we do. That's fascinating. Uh, and then, uh, so it, it could, but uh, by, I wanted to dial back into what you just said, something about the selective breeding aspects of the plant. What do you mean by that? And how can the cannabis plant through this types of selective breeding um, really unleash itself to eviscerate medicine and, and, and plastics and, and numerous other industries? So um, there's there's the traditional way of making pharmaceutical drugs is that you uh, break down some kind of substance into individual monomolecules, and then you give those monomolecules isolates to, to people. And what we've learned is that pharmaceutical drugs usually have a very wide range of side effects, and they're usually very expensive because that process of breaking it down into monomolecules is both not natural and is very costly. Okay, It serves the need of pharmaceutical companies. It doesn't serve the need of their patients very well. Most people who are taking pharmaceuticals are not satisfied with them. Uh, so on the other hand, with cannabis, you have a plant that gives us 140 plus cannabinoids and thousands, literally thousands of terpenes. And what we know from the 15 or so cannabinoids that have been studied in a semi-serious way is that they all have therapeutic effect and that different combinations of those cannabinoids and different terpenes also have different effects. So you have this therapeutic treasure chest. Just imagine, I'm not enough of a math head to be able to do it, but imagine all the thousands of terpenes multiplied by all of the uh, cannabinoids multiplied by all of the possible different combinations of all of those substances. We've got decades in front of us of studying this plant and using it to replace these dangerous pharmaceuticals. Now, here's the great thing. Because cannabis is so easily bred, right? And, and you can use smart breeding. Smart breeding basically means you use the techniques of genetic modification, but you don't do the last step of genetic modification. You just figure out how to breed plants that get you the, the specific chemovar or chemical profile that you want, okay? Once you have bred that plant, and you can do it in about three years for almost any chemovar that you want, then you have a plant that can go anywhere in the world. It can be planted by almost anybody, grown under some standard operating uh, procedures, harvested, and with a plant that costs about $200,000 to build, you can supply a small country with cannabis medicines. Nobody needs a patent. Nobody needs a bunch of capital. Nobody needs a bunch of dangerous regulations. It's almost universally effective. It's inexpensive, and it doesn't have a bunch of horrible side effects. Are there chemo vars for the industrial applications? Can I make a chemo can, over the course of three to five years? Could we make chemo vars for like, it's going to look like bamboo. I mean, like, you know, so it would just grow. Like, you know, the 25 uh, foot monsters that are out there in, in the... I mean, you're in the Bay. I mean, you've probably seen some very impressive sativas grown outdoors. Uh, what about that? Are there genetics like that we can unlock for the industrial purposes? Yeah, absolutely. Right. So, for example, um, you know, right now we press hemp seed for oil and that oil is used for a variety of purposes, including industrial purposes. Um, uh, you could breed a hemp plant that gave you a seed that had a desired profile for that oil so that you could have an oil that say was better for fuel to put in a car or a different oil that may be better for lubrication to use in industrial lubrication uh, purposes. So you could actually manipulate the quality of the oil that a particular cannabis genetic would produce. 
Um, that's you know one example. You could certainly um, uh, breed for things like disease resistance, for pest resistance, for increased yield, for shorter time to harvest, uh, for almost any agricultural or or industrial use characteristic that that you would want. Now, there's a vast body of history of this already. I've been to a place in Hungary called the Compolte Institute uh, that has been in operation like, continuously for a century and a half or something like that. Um, and they, uh, their job was to develop cannabis genetics for Hungary's hemp industry, which was a major, major part of the country's economy for many, many, many decades. Those institutes exist all over the world. Um, uh, a lot of their work, unfortunately, has been lost because of the cannabis holocaust that we've endured. But, um, but they didn't have smart being. We can do it. They, it. What took them generations to do, we can do in seasons. We can do in years. So, yeah, I mean, as, as amazing as cannabis is right now, we have cannabis that will sequester 20 tons of atmospheric carbon per hectare harvested, more than any other plant that we know of. Say we double it. Say we yep. double it. Right now, we could clean up planet Earth by planting 100 million acres of hemp. But it Suppose is. It, it, with 50 it, million. We might be able to get some research grants for. But I'm still, that's one of the other things with the administration aspects of it, because the USDA under Sonny Perdue did not give us any favors when it came to the hemp regulations that they gave us. They've just basically said, all these cultivars that you've just isolated over the past 10 years, fuck them. They're gone. You know, get into CBG if you want to grow it for plant, you know, for the actual flowers, or just row crop it and try to grow it for who knows what. And 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 those types of regulations are at the administrative level. And same with the DEA; they came out with an IFR uh, about a month ago, and it wasn't any favors. It said, you know, as soon as you throw that hemp into the extractor, that's marijuana, bro. And then oh, suddenly, this springing liability from like. Completely legal, completely legal, unscheduled regulations, completely legal, complete schedule one manufacturer of marijuana sufficient to be punished with lifetime in prison, spun out for the THC, completely legal, completely legal. It's just ridiculous. All right. Based well, look, it, it, but it, it's it, the laws have always been ridiculous. And the way that we show that they are ridiculous is by defying them. OK, so, OK, the DEA put out this absolutely ridiculous regulation saying that even if the crop that you grow is is 0.3 or below, even if the product you sell is 0.3 below, if at any point in your manufacturing process, it goes any at all above 0.3 percent THC, even though nobody ever gets to use it, then then you're subject to schedule one criminal prosecution. OK, um, uh, what would happen? If somebody with the right kind of resume, not a you know somebody like me, but somebody like with the right kind of resume, say Bob Hoban, say Bob Hoban uh, publicly defied that, uh, put together a manufacturing line, uh, called a press conference, had all of the news cameras come in and show exactly what the story was, put a couple of people up there who talked the benef about the benefits of hemp and said, hey, like I did with Harborside, you think it's not medicine? Come take me away. I'll well, fight Bob that one out in the court of public uh, opinion, dude. Right. Yeah. But, but Bob Hoban's actually on the paper for the, the case against the DEA. So Hoban and, and Kite's firm, uh, Rod Kite's firm, and a couple of other lawyers, they got in on that to, to try to enjoin them from it. And I'm like, all right, well, good at that. And so... Uh, no, he, Bob's he a friend, right? I totally yeah. support Bob. I'm not trying to throw shade on Bob. Oh, I'm no, just no, saying no, no, he's the kind of guy that has a resume that could do a case like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I could. Because that's the that's the real issue then, because then sometimes they're splitting hairs because this is this is hemp. According to the very broad definition of hemp, provided, of course, this this thing when when you throw the hemp into the extractor is ironed out, uh, which is the subject of the lawsuit, because, you know, that is an isomerization process of the extraction, which, of course, is also hemp. And then by the definition, that's also hemp, but it's called Delta 8 THC. The yeah, so what we really need is, is there's a lot of confusion both in our community and legally because of this very convenient legal, le legal loophole that people took advantage of, okay? Cannabis, until you had the farm bill, cannabis uh, uh, for human consumption, something that you put into your body, 
was regulated at the state level if it was regulated at all. Um, and, and it was regulated in, in the dispensaries through the means of, of those kinds of laws. Then what happened is with the, with the, the, the passage, or at least in the United States, then with the passage of the, of, of the Hemp Act, you started seeing, and it happened before that, but really got poured on after the Farm Bill, you started seeing people using the um, 0.3 hemp designation as a way to do an end run around regulations that are intended for consumable cannabis. So the idea was that, that was that the farm bill would apply to industrial hemp. And in fact, what happened is that it ended up being applied mostly to consumable hemp or consumable cannabis. So what I suggest is that we start thinking about this, at least in our community, in a different way. On the one hand, we have cannabis that's intended for human consumption. That needs to be tested. You need to make sure that it's safe. You need to make sure that when people put it into their bodies, nothing bad is going to happen. That doesn't have anything to do with the cannabinoid content. It has everything to do with making sure that it's free of contaminants, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, you're, you're right. So, Because that's the thing about when you talk about cannabis, it's so you're packing a lot. You're going, okay, look, this plant, this one plant can be industrial. It can make plastics. It can make rope. It can make sails like from the 1800s. Oh, hey, look, it's also medicine. Like the, when you talk about all the like chemivores and, and, and how you can cultivate it to, to each one to be specific, um, people don't understand though, the reason why it is medicine and can be is we all have an endocannabinoid system. And most doctors aren't talking about this. Most people, they're not talking about it in schools. They're not teaching us like, hey, this system is intertwined with both your nervous system and your bone structure. I, I mean, it's a huge neural network in our bodies that gets neglected. And this plant is like the orange juice. It's like when you go out to sea, I always say, like, you know, we find out like the lack of orange juice, vitamin C, you get scurvy from the sailors back in the day. Well, THC is kind of the same thing. You can you gotta find a balance. That's what I'm doing it for. Yeah, look, we there's two categories that make sense, and then there's subcategories within them, right? There's consumable cannabis and there's industrial cannabis. Consumable cannabis is the stuff we put on our body, and industrial cannabis is the is the is the plant when we grow it to make stuff out of it, right? And that's what actually logically makes sense. Um, uh, but, but instead we've gotten all hung up on this idea that hemp means 0.3% THC. Well, that number was not logically arrived at. It was just pulled out of the air by people who were trying to figure out what a good regulation that looked like. They knew absolutely nothing about cannabis. They didn't study it. They even admitted in the document that they wrote about it, that it was an arbitrary uh, designation. Right. It was and, and, you know, in today's day and age, the idea that, I mean, you could certainly have one, two, three, four percent THC cannabis and nobody's going to be trying to use that as a cover to sell it on the illicit market because it won't sell on the illicit market because nobody's going to buy crap like that. But it's such a it's such a testament to the miraculousness of this plant now and in all its factors. It's a very, very multifaceted plant. And then one of it is there's just this arbitrary number they picked out. And then from that arbitrary number they picked out, it turns out there's an entirely different cannabinoid. And you can you can breed the plant in such a way that it'll have a 20 to one ratio of it. So technically, you'll be able to you know pass that unless they consider the THCA version, which the statute doesn't reference at all. I mean, it's just, it's uh, from like a legal standpoint, because I like to have to look at like contracts and breaches and stuff, which is just so dry and clinical. It's exciting. But uh, at, at a historical standpoint, it makes me upset, you know, that our country isn't better than that. You know, we should have figured this out years ago. It should make you upset. It should make every American upset. It's an outrage. It's been an outrage from, from the very beginning. And you know what, what really bothers me is that these guys climb up on their high moral horse and throw shade on cannabis people, right? When if they had listened to us, if, if cannabis had never been illegal, that, you know, documented, millions of people would not have died. Millions of people would not have suffered. It's like, NIH knew about the cancer fighting properties of cannabis in the 1970s, okay? In the 1970s. And they did not do anything on that research in a positive way. They shit canned it. They buried it. They made sure that nobody knew about it, right? Uh, the only reason that we ended up knowing was because uh, Abrams uh, leaked Tashkin's study at the, at the end of the day, and we found out. So After decades. Michael, 
he right? was studying that for fucking decades. And you're like, right? always looking for the harm. And for some reason, these benefits keep coming to the surface for some reason. Right. So how many people, how many people died from cancers which could have been prevented or could have been treated since 1973 in this country? We're talking about a half century of death. And that's just okay. a wellness aspect. Imagine yeah, that's that's well, now that. you count up all the people who are locked up in prisons, who had their families destroyed, who had their lives destroyed, who died in prison, who got diseases in prison. You talk about all of the horrible racial oppression that's happened in communities all, all over the place. Um, there's real deaths. Do you think about, you know, everybody's seen the videos of the epileptic children who get treated with cannabis. 50 years of children like that literally shaking themselves to death, okay? The prohibitionists would rather have us have another 50 years of children shaking themselves to death, really, okay? And then there's the harms that are there, that are evident that nobody's really looked for, okay? So we treat hyperactive children, quote unquote, hyperactive children, mostly boys, the very large percentage of them, I was one of them in this country, by giving them speed, we give them a pharmaceutical form of amphetamine. It is an amphetamine. It's called Ritalin or Adderall. It is an amphetamine. Right. And, and that's what the pharmaceutical answer to hyperactive children is. Well, I can't tell you how many young men that I've talked to who are now older men, sometimes men my age, who describe how they had a difficult time focusing. They were really into everything. They were very energetic when they, when they were young. And they were given these drugs, which just made their lives much, much, much worse. And somehow they managed to find cannabis on their own. They somehow recognized, despite all of the stigma, everybody telling them it was a bad thing, they could recognize that it worked for them. They embraced it and they started performing generally at an exceptional level of achievement. Okay. So how many of those high achievers would have been locked into lives of chemical dependency on a really sick and demented kind of pharmaceutical instead of having their lives blossom with the help of cannabis and they get on their moral high horses and, and throw shade on me and other activists? And yeah, Jeff really? Has the frickin' balls to say that good people don't use marijuana? Is he kidding? You know, uh, no, he's, he's not. That's the prejudice and that prejudice runs deep. And so like, you know, it, West Coast conservatives are more like, personal freedom conservatives but like east coast conservatives midwestern included they're more of the moral reproach and like judgment conservatives where it's like i would never i haven't seen you at church lately fred you know like those types where it's it's a brand of like the the scarlet letter wasn't written in california you know uh, that wouldn't have done it but like you know the scarlet letter was written hundreds of years ago uh you know in, in in puritanical times but that puritanical aspect and then it got looped into that where this was the devil's lettuce and people still to this day in certain circles it seems believe it i just don't understand why well you sit them down and you say look you know i understand that you have a, a value system that that you try to live your life by and um, and and so you know what is that value system what are the principles that are important to you and they'll trot out a, a list of principles and then you sit there and you go down the list of principles and you explain to them how embracing cannabis will help advance every single one of those principles if, if you want to bring people and make people more responsible if you want people to be more thoughtful if you want them to be more in touch with god if you want them to be more in touch with nature if you want them to be more gentle if you want them to think more carefully about what they do right um, then cannabis is the way for people to do that. And, and so, you know, what we know is that cannabis, everybody who uses cannabis has a certain set of experiences with it. Those experiences teach us certain lessons. And those lessons have informed a common value system. And so wherever we are around the world, there are certain things that we respect and believe in creativity. We think creativity is always more important than conformity. We always think that individual freedom is more important than, than government or, or religious authority. We always think that nature is more important than profit. Um, this is who cannabis people are uh, all around the, the world. And, and so 
you know, now we have this really unique opportunity um, for all of us to come together, to recognize each other, and to really make some changes in this world. Uh, it's a very powerful value system. Uh, if there was ever a time that the world needs a plant that teaches you how to turn an argument into a discussion, that needs to teach you how to love instead of hate, uh, that needs you to teach you to to be more in touch with nature instead of more lusting for profit, then that plants cannabis in the time that we need it is now. Especially with the last prison project that you're a part of. I really appreciate that with your success and where you're at. And that's the give back that I always think people should be doing. Thank you. I, I, I was impossible for me to do anything else, right? I spent most of my life in the underground. Um, I um, know many people who are still in prison today. And many, many other people have been in prison. I've been locked up in those steel boxes myself a few times in my life. And I grew up in a, you know, in a racially mixed neighborhood. I had a lot of, I had a lot of friends who were people of color. It was very evident to me that like I would get caught by a cop or a teacher and the bull got dumped on the lawn and they got hauled off to juvenile court and convicted and kicked out of school. It was pretty evident to me, the racial disparity in cannabis law enforcement for many, many, many decades. But it's kind of hard to get people out of prison for something that's still illegal. But as soon as we made cannabis illegal in California, in fact, before we made it illegal in California, I started thinking about the fact that it was going to be legal. Um, that was the first thing that crossed my mind. I was like, we, we cannot go out and build an industry where mostly white rich people are building intergenerational wealth. And meanwhile, you have tens of thousands, 40,000 that we know of probably more um, prisoners just in the United States alone um, uh, and, and, and disparately people of color. So I, I can't be one of those people who goes to the office in the morning and makes profit off of legal cannabis without taking care of the brothers and sisters of ours who are still locked in cages for doing exactly the same thing I do every day. Yeah, and I won't, I won't share the money with them. Like, you know, when I'm when I'm doing business and I find somebody that's just an opportunist and they they look at us like we're drug addicts. No. And I want to direct people to your 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 YouTube channel, um, you because you're doing a radio thing. Uh, but also on top of that, uh, you have some awesome videos. Uh, you're doing one with Cravain Cooper. Uh, I watched it. I uh, wanted to cry, um, to be honest. And uh, but your free radio cannabis show, which is are you doing that weekly or how are you doing that? Yeah. So radio free cannabis It's named after radio free Europe, which was like this thing back in the uh, Iron Curtain communist right, days. Right. Um, and, in West Germany. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It was it was introduced to me as the vice of freedom that got beamed beyond the Iron Curtain. Later, I found out it was fully funded arm of the U.S. government propaganda channel. <laughs> Another story for me. What it symbolized and the reason I chose this name is that there was a small little beachhead of freedom that had been opened up in the world. And that's how we viewed the United States when I was a little boy growing up, believe it or not. And, and, and we've done that with cannabis here, right? We have opened up this beachhead, but still in most of the world, in, for, for the vast majority of the world's population, uh, cannabis remains very, very illegal. And I wanted to do two things with the with the the podcast. I I wanted to you know inculcate this idea that uh, that all of us are are part of a, a community that we've all learned these lessons that we all share this value system that we are one tribe of cannabis people worldwide, and and then the other thing that I want to do is. Uh, figure out a way that we can talk to each other, that we can reason, that we can learn how to move as one. Imagine what would happen if, you know, the UN says there's 239 million of us around the world. I think there's probably three or four times that many of us. Collectively, we're larger than all but the largest nations. What would happen if all of us converted half of our wardrobe or, yeah, say half of our wardrobe to hemp next year over the course of a year? How many hectares of hemp would that produce? And how many atmospheric tons of carbon would remove from oh, the atmosphere? That's yeah. the kind of thing we can do together as a tribe. And I think that you're you're not far off from seeing like Levi's or, or Patagonia having cultivars that they may have helped create for their like because what do they want to do? They they know that people are just like us and they believe in uh, renewable energy and, and this cannabis plant and we'll buy 
hemp if we have the opportunity to do it. But then the supply chain, it takes time to catch up. And so, like, again, hemp's only really been legal since 2019 in this country. I mean, like it was the farm bill was signed into law about Christmas time of 2018. That's it. You know, this is the second harvest. That's it. We're just at the beginning of an epical change in human behavior, okay? For the past couple thousands of years, we've been moving progressively towards more industrialized, more hierarchical societies that are marked by authoritarianism, unfortunately, more and more warfare, more and more death and, and climate change. And so we are in the beginning stages of moving from a very primitive, extractive technology and economy which sought to dominate Mother Nature to learning slowly and painfully, hopefully we figure out how to do it quickly enough, how to work with mother nature, how to build a new life affirming economy. And so this whole structure of pharma and arma and petro and all of these industries, which are the pillars of the way that we live our lives must be changed if we're to survive as a species. We're just in the beginning of that change. It's gonna be a multi-generational change. And um, and so teach your children well. We're going to be at this for a little while. All right, let's do it. Uh, Steve, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, where can we go to find and follow what you guys got going on? Uh, let's see. On Instagram, I am at Steve uh, on the on the Internet. I am Steve D'Angelo dot com. Um, and uh, and then the show is Radio Free Cannabis, is our weekly podcast, drops every Sunday, available on, on all of the usual platforms. But we do encourage people to use YouTube uh, version because it is translated with the auto-translate function on YouTube into 195 different languages. So uh, we want to make sure that, uh, that we can reach our audience no matter where they are in the world. So we encourage that, that YouTube version. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on and thanks for tuning in, everyone. Make sure you like and subscribe to keep up with all cannabis legalization news. We will see you on Wednesday. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you, man. Thanks.